Yay. All right. Good evening, everyone. I am Deborah Marshall, and I'm in California, and I'm bringing the lesson this evening on Acts chapter 21. Before I start, I would like to go ahead and pray. So, Father, I come to you this evening. I praise you. I thank you. I magnify you. I exalt you because you alone are God and you're worthy to be praised. I thank you for this opportunity that has been assigned to me. I ask that what the Holy Spirit has given me will, at least those that are present, will be able to get one thing that they can take away from this lesson. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so um, Acts chapter 21, the background, I'm going to jump into um, Acts chapter 20, and I'm looking at it from the Amplified Version. Verse 4 reveals Paul was accompanied by several individuals, um, Sopater, S-O-P-A-T-E-R of Berea, the son of Pyrrhus, P-Y-R-R-H-U-S, and Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians and by Gaius and Derby and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. They went ahead waiting at Troas along with Luke. Paul continues to state, we're still in chapter 20, um, verse 23, that the Holy Spirit affirms to him in city after city that imprisonment and suffering would await him. Verse 24, he states that he does not consider his life as something of value so that he can finish his course and the ministry to testify faithfully of the good news of God's grace. He then hits them with a blow that they would not see him again. He also warns them that false teachers will come in not sparing the flock, also warning them to be continually alert. So a brief summary, Paul was aware of his position as an apostle and he knew that whatever he did and wherever he would go, the purpose was to let others know about Christ and to teach and train people of the selflessness of Christ. Due to his commitment after that road to Damascus experience in Acts chapter 9, he too took on the selflessness of his life and serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and trials, which come which came on him because of the plots of the Jews against him. And that's Acts 20, 19, and that's Amplified Version. Even though Paul was with fellow believers in his journey, he recognized that he did not know what would happen to him going to Jerusalem, but that he was going to be obedient and go and share the good news and face whatever came his way. And we know in this ministry, we hear pray and obey on a regular. So he was going to be obedient. So verses one through seven in Acts 21, the journey leaving Miletus begins and they find a ship crossing over to Phoenicia and set sail. They get to Tyre and looked up the disciples and stayed with them for about seven days. The disciples kept telling Paul through the Holy Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. Then the days there came to an end and the disciples and their families escorted Paul and the others outside the city. They prayed and they told one another goodbye and there were tears and they boarded the ship. They landed at Ptolemaeus and after greeting the believers, stayed with them for only one day. Verses 8 through 18, Acts chapter 21, they left and ended up in Caesarea and went on to the evangelist Philip's house, one of the seven deacons chosen in Acts chapter 6. So in Acts chapter 6, it was Stephen who was stoned and Nicanor and several others, but you can find that in Acts chapter six. A prophet named Agabus came from Judea. He took Paul's band and bound his own feet and hands and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says, that the owner of this band will be bound and handed over to the Gentiles. Those in attendance began pleading with Paul, trying to persuade him not to go to Jerusalem. Paul indicates to them that he is ready not only to be bound and imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. The people then stopped trying to persuade him and indicated that the Lord's will be done. They landed at Cyprus at the home of a disciple uh, where they were to lodge and they were welcome in Jerusalem. And the next day they went to see James and all the elders of the church. Um, Acts 21 verses 19 through 26 <clears throat> After greeting the people, Paul gave a detailed account of the things God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. 
They glorified and praised God. Then there was a discussion of questioning Paul's teaching, which they felt was a turning away from the law of Mo Moses. The people noted that others would hear about Paul's arrival. There were four men who had taken a vow and purify themselves, and Paul was to pay their expenses for the temple offerings, and they would shave their heads. The conclusion was that Paul was following the law. There also was a letter sent for the people to abstain from meat sacrificed to idols. Paul took the four men, and the next day he purified himself, himself along with the men. Acts 21, verses 27 through 40. The seven days for the ritual were almost completed and Jews from the province of Asia saw him and began to stir up the crowd and seized him, accusing him of teaching all men everywhere against our people and the law, also accusing him of bringing Greeks into the temple, defiling the holy place. They assumed that he had brought the man into the temple and he was a Greek. The whole city was provoked and confused and rushing to seize Paul, dragging him out of the temple. They were trying to kill Paul and word got to the commander of the Roman garrison that all Jer Jerusalem was in a state of upheaval. He took so soldiers and centurions and ran down among them. When the people saw the commander, they stopped beating Paul. Paul was arrested and ordered to be bound with two chains. Paul was questioned as to who he was and what he had done. Verses 20 through 27 through 40 in Acts 21. The crowd was shouting confusing accusations and the commander couldn't determine that fact because of the uproar. Paul was taken to the barracks but had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob, shouting away with him, killing. Paul, before being taken to the barracks, asked the commander um, if he could speak to him. The commander was surprised that he knew Greek, assuming him to be the Egyptian who had previously stirred up a rebellion. Paul explained who he was, a Jew from Tarsus. He begged the commander to allow him to speak to the people, and there was a great hush. He spoke to them in the Hebrew derelict Aramaic. So the conclusion that I got in um, reading this several times was Paul had an assignment after his road to Damascus experience in Acts 9 to serve the Lord with humility. So my question to us is, are we serving the Lord with humility? Are we, whatever God has given us to do, are we doing it in a humble state of mind? Point number two, Paul had no fear of what was happening, what would happen to him. Um, sometimes I think, when I think of the verse, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind, we forget. And sometimes we allow fear to stop us from doing what God has asked us and told us to do. And then just in listening to what Apostle was saying about what can we do to get people, a short snippet of how can we get people to be interested, whatever they're going through, what can we do? Well, instead of fearing what we could do, we could ask God, the Holy Spirit, to give us what we can do. Point number three, Paul bravely followed the leading of the Holy Spirit that directed him to go to Jerusalem, well aware of imprisonment and suffering that would await him. Um, often we are not, when we're led by the Holy Spirit, we don't take that direction, we detour. But Paul took the direction and followed what the Holy Spirit said to do, which was to go to Jerusalem, even though you might be in prison or you would be in prison and suffer. But Paul did it. And a lot, oftentimes the Holy Spirit will tell us things to do and we don't always do it. Maybe you do, but I know I don't. So that's good that you do it. But a lot of times we don't do what we are told by the Holy Spirit to do. Point number four, Paul boldly spoke his heart. Paul knew what he was doing. Paul had a boldness in his delivery. Paul was not afraid. He would go in wherever he needed to go. Paul would tell the people about Christ and what he had done. And there was a boldness in what he was doing in his speaking from his heart. And we too have to have a boldness to speak the word of God. We too have a, have a boldness not to back down in spite of what me, what might be going on around us. Apostle shared that people are panicking right now because they don't know what's going to happen. But we have no reason to panic because God said, God is, has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. 
there's no reason for us to fear. Whatever's going to take place, God said he would never leave us nor forsake us. So we have all of these assurances that we need to walk in and boldly walk in them. Point number five, Paul prayed when departing from the group of disciples in Miletus. Um, I, I remember my um, uncle was a pastor and whenever he came to our house, he would always pray before he left. And not only would he pray, he had a bottle of anointing oil and he would just take and put a little dab in our forehead and he would pray and then that would be his departure. So praying is a powerful tool. We all know that. I also remember I was in a ministry of moms in prayer. And when I went to the, um, like a uh, seminar session that they had, and I met the lady that was the founder of moms in prayer. And when I told her um, the circumstance about my grandson and what he was going through, she stopped immediately and prayed with me. There were people around her trying to get her to come and do something else. But when she heard this, the, 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 I want to say the pain that I was going through in my voice about my grandson, she immediately stopped and took my hand and prayed with me. So we need to pray, whatever the circumstances, we need to stop and not be afraid to pray for those that we come in contact with. Um, I'm learning to do that in this glue assignment that Apostle has us working in. Um, the people that contact us, I'm, I may not be talking to them, with a prayer, but I type a prayer in the database and send it to them. And um, so praying is a tool that is always of value to us. Number six, Paul urged the Jews and Greeks to turn in repentance to God and to have faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for salvation. So Paul urged anyone he came in contact with, Jew, Greek, whoever it was, to repent to God and have faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for salvation. And my last point is Paul warned the people to be alert for false teachers would come in to dissuade them in their faith. And that's so true for us as well. We have to be on alert. There are so many apostles and prophets and teachers. And if they're not preaching and teaching from the word of God and not directing us to the word, we have to be on guard and be alert because in scripture, it says, even the very elect will be led astray. So um, in conclusion, I thank you for your time. I thank you for listening. If you have any questions, I guess this is the opportunity to ask any questions that you may have. No questions. Um, so I have a question. It was something that was, can you hear me, Deborah? Barely. Can you hear me, Deborah? Yes, now. Perfect. Okay, so there's something that's highlighted to me, and it was the fact that they they made it in the Bible, it highlights that Paul was bound with two chains. Mm -hmm. It's also highlighted in Acts 12 and in, what is it, 1st or 2nd Timothy 2. It talks, it's very specific about that. Do, do you know anything about that? Like, no, you know that that um I didn't get a chance to research that because it does talk about that in Acts 21 that he was bound with um two chains, and I don't know the significance to that. I would have to research that and get back with you. It says it says one was to hold him down and one was to appease the people. Hoovers. I don't know. But it's it's in 21 and it's also in acts 12 and then it talks about it in timothy so what's the chain that appeased people we are, is that a spiritual is that significant to oppression maybe is that i'd have to look at it for sure yeah i'd have to look it up what's the context of it it was in acts 21 where it talks about yeah, I see it at verse 33. It says, Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. Well, I, yeah. I, I always would think the, the two chains would be binding his feet and binding his hands would be the two areas that would be bound. The enemy wants to find how you walk and how you serve. 
Right. Um, I know this also talked about the Agabus, I think his name was, that talked about he, he used the belt. Oh, yeah, Agabus, right, he did. Uh -huh. There's that, what's, because he, he describes why he's going to be found. Right, because there, there's also a rapper that's famous now who has a lot of question, well, of course, questionable lyrics, satanic undertones, and, and his name is Two Chains. Um, well, in verse 10, it starts a prophet. Yes. Yeah. And Agabus. He, mm -hmm. he said to Cain, he put a belt and bound his feet and hands. Mm -hmm. So those were the two chains, his binding his feet and binding his hands. And this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews in Jerusalem will bind him who owns this belt and hands, hand him over to the Gentiles. So in the spirit realm, that's what the enemy really wants to do. He wants us not to walk free, and he doesn't want us to serve free. Mm -hmm. um, when he heard this, uh, began begging. So, so they were just saying that they didn't want him to go. So that would be my just off the cuff. When I read it down there, that's what I thought the two bounds were. And then up here, as the prophet says, those are two areas that were bound. Right. Um, and so spiritually, I would I would relate that to the two things that I that I just said. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be the significance. Now, why a rapper would have chains on? Well, that's a huge thing, you know. Well, that's talking about power and control. And if you're talk, talking about master slave mm -hmm. type of there's a lot of songs that talk about chains. Yeah, but that's that's more in the uh dominance to dominate people. The person that's in chains or is the one that's gonna be dominated by the one that's not, who's the keeper of the key. Mm -hmm. Um, so in the world system, it, it, it's pervert, perverted. It's music. Yeah. 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 Entertainment sphere. That's it. Well, I don't know how it's entertainment, but you know, people <laughs> do find entertainment that way. Um, so that, that's my take on it. The one verse that kind of stood out to me. Can you hear me, Deborah? Yes, ma'am. I thought I had a big mouth. Verse 21 and they had told him about you, uh, that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to abandon Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. This is a big thing where people don't believe Paul because he was teaching not to follow the law. And we're going to find that uh, a lot where people are going to ask you questions. Well, how come God is so, you know, killing people all the time? And, mm -hmm. and how come he seems like he just he kills kids? And, you know, um, or they'll say, well, if the Old Testament says this, how come you're not doing it in the New Testament? A lot of people will blame Paul for that that Paul came up with another doctrine, that he came up with another doctrine that was not in alignment with what the Old Testament said. And so the question I have for you is what do you say to such a person? How do you answer someone who says that Paul is making the, Jew, the Gentiles abandon the law and the customs that they had? What is going to be your answer? That's a real question. Romans 8, it says, Kahola, you know, it tells me what Romans 8, you know. But Romans is written by Paul. They're discounting Paul. So any Pauline scriptures you use, they're going to discount it because Paul is starting a new doctrine. Mm -hmm. So how, 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 go ahead. <laughs> Any thoughts? I mean, I just try to explain to them that it's not the letter, but the spirit of the law. 
And if they can't understand that, you know, they don't, you know, they have to reconcile the fact of being born again. Okay. What were you going to say, Sharon? Just, uh, well, yeah, you talking about excluding the Pauline epistles, that makes it a little bit, you have to really, for me, I guess I went back to the Old Testament where it talks about, and I think it talks about in the New Testament too, about the new covenant, you know, that Jesus has, um, that God is establishing with Jesus. Um, and so, of course, we know that he came to fulfill uh, the, the law, um, but again, it's by way of the spirit and not by way of legalism or traditional. Um, and so that would require definitely some um, more descriptives to explain that to that person. It probably would be hard for them to understand that if they're so caught up and embedded in having to walk out the Ten Commandments in, in, in the Old Testament. So I just search this answer or like if Paul was doing that, wouldn't it have been written? What do you mean what would it been? If that is what Paul had done, wouldn't it have been written? I mean you think about it. Because the Bible says you can't take away or add to the Bible. Well, that's in Re Revelations. It says you shall not take or add from this book. Revelation is a book. Not the Bible. Oh, a book. That, oh, I never realized that. I mean, I'm just saying that that's an argument. That the book of Revelation don't add or take away from this last book. Uh, I don't know. I was thinking. <laughs> The whole, the whole thing with, yes, you can look at the Old Testament, but one of the things you can see to not use Pauline scriptures, but try to use some something out of James, because James was the head of the Jerusalem church. He did not go out. He didn't evangelize. He didn't. His assignment was to the Jews. And so what you would do is you would make a statement based on someone who was assigned to the Jews. You could also possibly use the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, because they're not Pauline books. So you would use the Gospel to seek to uh, say how uh, the law and grace is for, for everyone. And so understanding the thrust of people not believing in Paul or not even believing you have some people who don't believe in the New Testament. They only believe in the Old Testament. Yeah. And so we have to be able to give an account from the Old Testament. What Old Testament can you do? Can you use what prophets can you use to make your point to, to win people to Christ where they are? Because we can't fight people with information that we know. We have to fight people, or not fight, but make us a case based on what they know and what they believe. Okay? And the only way that we can do that is we have to know these different doctrines that people believe and begin to kind of brush up our, our speech so that we can meet people where they are. Because not everyone's going to meet us where we are. Not everyone believes every book in, in the Bible. Uh, my brother and I have this talk all the time because he's definitely stuck on the law. He doesn't believe in grace. He doesn't he doesn't believe. Uh, he believes in all the feasts. I mean, we have this back and forth conversation, and no matter what I say, he comes back with something else. We continue to have this conversation. He continues to try to win me over that I'm practicing a heresy, right? And so we're going to have people in the last days that's going to have these persuading arguments. Some of the things they're saying is, sounds pretty good, but almost good is not necessarily true. So we have to know what we believe and be able to prove it first to ourselves, and then we can begin to express that to other people. Because I'm kind of, kind of with that right now with um, somebody that God's having me disciple, and I mean, everything I say, he just comes back to me. I mean, and I'm just like, 
And in some instances, I catch myself getting upset because I don't, you know, and I have to just be like, I have to just say, man, I love you. I gotta let you go, you know? But then there's other times where I'm like, I can't believe that just came out of my mouth because the Holy Spirit has stepped in and he's speaking through me to this person. Well, the first thing and is have, like, I don't, and how can I, have, it's just a Bible just coming out in a way and I can see this person's wall just coming down and that uh, and the Holy Spirit just touching them on the level that they need to be touched. It has nothing to do with me, but I'm watching this and I'm, it's my mouth moving, but it's not my words. And I'm like, any other time, I can't even tell you what was said, but I know it's the word of God because I know, I know the Bible. I know the Bible, but it's just like, and he does it for us in instances. And then there are some times where, you know, he's, it feels like he's watching and just seeing what we'll do. And like this conversation is good because it helps to train us better in those areas. Because I mean, I, there's been many times where it's like, come on, come on, it's the Holy Spirit. We, we definitely have to be led by the Spirit when we're dealing with people who don't believe what we believe. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to get upset because they don't believe what you believe. Mm -hmm. Jesus and the Godhead can take care of himself. Well, and so yeah. having an attitude of having fun. Mm -hmm. I had a person I was telling Sharon that didn't be believe what I was saying last night on the street. He was telling me that this is what it was. And I'm like, well, that's great. That, you know, but this is this is the spiritual aspect of it. And by the time it was done, he was like, well, you just taught me something because I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. But before I explained it to him, I said, we have every right to disagree with each other. And I'm okay with that. Yeah. Right, right, and, and, right. And not getting upset because people don't believe what you believe. Right. I, I'm sure in this room and online that we all don't believe the same thing. I know we don't, yeah. because I hear you guys. We all have different beliefs. Such as? Do you, uh, you may not believe that uh, you can cast out demons, because you're not called for that. Right? That's somebody else's job. But it's the commission. Well, yes, but not everybody thinks it's their anointed for it. Not everyone necessarily has faith to say that they can speak to the atmosphere and it obeys them. <laughs> That's okay for somebody else. <laughs> but I can't do that because of something that I've done. Or speaking life into others, but not yourself. I mean, it, there's a host of things that we all differ on because we're all different people and all of our walks are different. And so if everyone in this room has different walks, you can better believe someone who's never stepped in the church is not going to believe what you believe. And so why are you going to get mad at it? Well, like I said, I felt it coming up, but I didn't express it. But that demon knew. I mean, Well, was... all I'm saying is that we have to learn to have patience and grace with people. Right. And we have to learn what we believe and be able to express it in a lot of in the old and in the new testament because when i was talking to this guy i used the stronghold back in, in the old testament and i told him the stronghold of jesus is a stronghold and i used the new testament and you know i built my case based on the old and new testament and that's what you have to do when you're speaking to people is you have to use both because not everyone believes both but if you use both you have both areas covered right so just challenge yourself to be able to share the gospel in a way um, that you that you may face people in your life and, and your go-to scripture, they might not accept it because of where it's written and who wrote it. Right? Mm -hmm. So that was the one text that really kind of stood out to me to kind of have that conversation. That was good. A good conversation. That's really all I have. I didn't, I didn't, I don't have a bunch. Anything else, Deb? Nope, I'm done. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll have a
another short night. Then, Father, we thank you for the night. We thank you for the teacher of the hour. Yes. We thank you for the questions and conversations that we've had. We love you, Father. We honor, praise, glorify, and magnify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.